the pro days. I know a lot of people are tracking this. I know a lot of people are excited about it. Definitely not asking you to give us the full rundown because there's a ton, but a couple of things that stand out. Um, you know, what number do we need to know who has changed their draft stock the most? You know, pro days for me are tough. I, I pretty much fade pro days. Um, you know, you look at, especially now, so many players are opting for pro days versus the combine. The combine is there for a reason. It's a standard measurement. Everybody's on the same playing field. Everybody's doing it at the same time. They're they're factoring in these uh, these unknown variables. At the pro day, there's different, you know, there's not an official timer for the 40 yard dash you could have six guys timing six different times it's often reported through media it's not even an official statement for most teams you know like michigan did a great job putting out an official website with all the pro day times that doesn't happen for every team uh you're in your home environment you get to be comfortable uh you're you're throwing the, you know if you're a quarterback or a wide receiver you're throwing or catching the ball from the guys that you always throw and catch the ball from so unless something really stands out in the pro day, I pretty much fade it. Now I am somebody who I don't have to plug, you know, I don't need a number in, in terms of a athletic testing to, to be able to round out a formula. So that's a little bit of a privilege in my process that I don't need to rely on the pro days, but I, I don't put much stock into them. Was there anyone who didn't test at the combine who tested at the pro days that was there anything in that aspect that might have stood out, or at the, at, as, you, as you said a moment ago, you're just not putting much stock into it? Yeah, I'm not putting much stock into it, you know. And I think, if anything, and I, I guess I'm just doubling down on my take here. If anything, I think it leads to some red herrings, right? Like you look at a guy like Michael Penix, right? Michael Penix, I, what was it a four six or something? Everybody heard Michael his Penix. 40. Yeah, he, he. Everyone loved. I hope he's he not ran. listening to Road of His Overtime this week. <laughs> He's unsubscribing. He's going to leave some negative. Yeah, that's, you never know whose parent is watching. I've, I've found with these prospects, but uh, you know, he runs in a straight line and he runs a great 40 time for a quarterback at his pro day. And then folks get excited about it. And, and if you know, if you haven't watched his tape, you're thinking, ah, maybe this guy isn't, is a mobile quarterback. It's like, well, the reason he doesn't run guys, it's not because he's not mobile. It's because he's had four season ending injuries. And Washington told him like, listen, bud, if you want to, if you want to be successful, you got to stay in the pocket, right? So I do find that that it could be more of a red herring than anything else in this process. As we move into running backs, we've had a vote for Trey Benson. We've had a vote for Jonathan Brooks from our previous guests in terms of the running backs at the top of this class. I'm interested in your thoughts on those guys as well, but with them being maybe the most obvious choices or maybe you have a different choice at the top end of this class, can you give us a different candidate as a top prospect? Maybe you have one, and then you can, if you want, you can dive into those two guys as well. I'm happy to nominate a different candidate here. I'm in on Braylon Allen. Uh, I'm I've, I'm all in on this take. He's not only my running back one, but he's a clear tier above any other running back in the class for me. You're looking at a powerful runner. You're looking at a patient runner, a guy who I believe has good vision. He's bursty into the second level of the field. He's a downhill runner. He will build that speed up as he's moving downfield. Excellent contact balance and an absolute producer at the goal line as well. I think Allen isn't given enough credit for how shifty he is in short space. I think he's more elusive than he appears. There is lateral agility, and he will shake defenders in a phone booth. He's able to sidestep, bounce to the outside with fluidity. And, and he's a reliable target in the passing game as well. You know, uh, probably not more than 30, 35 targets in a season, but I think he can bring in 75% of those, which is, you know, plenty added on to a, a fantasy football running backs numbers. The thing with Braylon Allen too, that I will add on to his, his context, his background, he put up back to back 1200 plus yard seasons as a true freshman and true sophomore at Wisconsin as a true freshman, he did that at 17 years old, uh, dominating against Big Ten defenses, which is the smash mouth load the box conference, right? That's super impressive for me, that early breakout when it comes to Braylon Allen. The other piece of context, you know, I, I've had this conversation with a lot of folks who have watched Braylon Allen's 2023 tape or have looked at those 2023 numbers and are really worried or think he's going downhill or decreasing. You have to understand the significant scheme change that Wisconsin made. Wisconsin went from a traditional power running offense that fit Braylon Allen, the 6'1", 235-pound uh, cut-up running back very well, 
to a quasi air raid offense. So they brought in Phil Longo, who you may remember from uh, the Sam Howell years um, or, you know, Drake May's uh, first year of production in North Carolina. They brought in an air raid offensive coordinator, totally flipped over the offense with no personnel to fit it, right? They still had these big linemen that were that were built for run blocking. They didn't have the wide receivers, and it was just an absolute mess because they didn't even fully commit to the air raid. They just went air raid concepts. Uh, and so Braylon Allen understandably looked out of place. He looked uncomfortable. He wasn't set up for success in 2023. So you go back, watch those first two years of tape. You're going to see a much better runner, a much more confident runner and a runner who, who has better vision because he's more confident in, in what's going on on the field. So uh, Braylon Allen is it for me. You have production, you have size and, and you have a vision, which, which is really important for me when, when analyzing the running back position. Anywhere with him that you're hoping maybe landing spot wise, or you know, what would your dream situation for him be? I mean, or I think the easy answer is the Dallas. Capital. Dallas, right? Yeah, yeah. Da- Dallas is is the pick, but you could put Dallas in for any of these guys, and they're the perfect, you know, the perfect guy. I I, I think you know, just keep in mind with draft capital, right? It's get, it's going to be relative for this class. We're not looking at any likely running back ones from this class, right? So don't fade the running backs entirely just because they're not going to get top 50 draft capital. Braylon Allen might be the first running back drafted. He might be the third running back drafted. But for me in my draft capital range, the way that I build out my, my rating system, it doesn't matter if you go pick 51 to 102. It's the exact same draft capital for me. And I expect that pretty much any running back who folks are going to you know make an argument for as a running back one is going to go in that range. So you don't think there's a pretty significant risk that he falls into day three? It's possible. I, I mean, I've been wrong. <laughs> you know, I've definitely been wrong on prospects before. Um, and I know I'm not consensus on this. But when when I'm watching his tape, when I'm looking at his profile, it just doesn't make sense for me. You know, I think the one argument against Braylon Allen is the fact that he has faded the testing. He hasn't done the athletic testing, which does lead you to believe that he's not confident in how he would perform in that testing. So I I think if you're going to fade Braylon Allen, that's the argument to make. Um, But everything else is so good for me that that I do struggle to see him going into day three. So this isn't going to come as a surprise to you, but Dave Cabin's breakaway rush scores agree that this is a terrible class. One of the things that I think is disconcerting is that it, one of the things you like about the breakaway rush scores, there is actually a pretty big volume component to it as opposed to percentage component. And so you do actually have to have production along with the breakaway element. And that is a problem for the guys who are actually really athletic in this class and keeps raising the red flags for them. So when you see the breakaway rush scores for the guys who are actually the big time athletes, like, well, yeah, I mean, we knew that they didn't do a lot, but they're still athletic. And some of the peripherals on a per play basis are actually pretty good. So that kind of works in the background of my question of who is the best big play threat from this group? You know, from the running back position, for me, when I'm thinking of a big play type guy, you know, Marshawn Lloyd comes to mind for me. I think he's a super athletic runner. Uh, I, I think he's a twitchy guy. Um, you won't see a ton of volume from him but he's got good burst and he does have that home run play ability to him. Uh, he'll bounce to the outside and he'll, he'll turn upfield and accelerate very well. And he has pass catching ability. He's elusive in space after the catch. So if we're talking about that, that home run type swing, he's the type of guy that I, I'd be locking in on. I don't know how deep we're going to go down at this question point into, you know, I, I'm always looking for the, sleepers i'm always trying to find those out for the road of his ot listeners so we can share them but maybe we're not even down at that point yet but maybe we are in terms of a, a surprising name who could be you know a, a long-term three down back profile in terms of their upside is there it doesn't again it doesn't have to be far down the, the the totem pole here but who would that be for you in this class yeah so especially if we're talking three down potential my sleeper is going to be isaiah davis out of south dakota state i'm a big fan of the isaiah davis tape 60218 uh, when you're watching an fcs running back you don't want to see him play well you want to see him physically dominate right and when you watch isaiah davis play he dominates he's a shifty runner he cuts seamlessly through space 
He's got really good burst off the line of scrimmage. He accelerates really well downfield. He sees space. He hits space. He's got great anticipation to understand when gaps are going to open for him. And here's the big thing. He he's physical. He runs through. I mean, literally runs through FCS defenders with the ball in his hands. Great contact balance. Excellent at the goal line. Uh, Davis wasn't always used in the passing game, but he has reliable hands when he was. And, and, you know, I compare Davis to, you know, with the high school, your high school football team, you know, there's that guy who's just always on the field because he's just too good to get off the field. Uh, Isaiah Davis was over 200 touches on the ground this past year at South Dakota State. And when he wasn't running the ball, they didn't rotate him off the field. They used him as a lead blocker. They lined him up and let him block and open up space for, for the other running back. And he can clear space through very well. So, you know, you're looking at a really tenacious guy, really physical guy. I think he probably will go day three based on the fact that he was an FCS player. But I think NFL teams are really going to like this guy. And, and he's got the size uh, and, and profile to be able to hold up as a three down back, you know, if a guy or two goes, you know, goes out in front of him. I like that answer. It doesn't, you know, always hit with the smaller school guys, especially when they're drafted late. But that's a really fun name to keep in mind in this class. For the next question, we don't normally ask the questions like this, but <laughs> I mean, I, there's just no other great way. Well, there are plenty of ways to put it, but today I'm just going to ask you, know, what's the deal with Will Shipley? Yeah, that's fair. That's a fair question with Will Shipley. This is tough. You know, being being a, a Devi guy, you know, Will Shipley has been all around the rankings. I, I've had Will Shipley relatively high up in my rookie rankings. I've always appreciated uh, his pass catching ability, or I should say I've, I've had him high up in my Devi rankings. He's not necessarily high in my rookie rankings, but, um, you know, I've always appreciated that pass catching ability from Shipley. He's got good hands. He turns up field very well. Uh, he, he has a good understanding of space with the ball in his hands after the catch. Uh, and, and in terms of, of running, you know, he is a scrappy runner. You know, he's a one cut runner. He navigates uh, in between tight space. Well, he's got a nice jump step. He's got good lateral agility. Uh, the thing for me with Will Shipley is that it was just never consistent, right? He wasn't able to consistently produce. And there's reasons, you know, you certainly could argue that in 2022, he was the entire offense. And then in 2023, you know, Cade Klubnick didn't exactly come in and, you know, open space for him. So he is down board for me. You know, he's not in my top 48 on the rookie big board. I could see him getting better draft capital than we expect. I know my co-host on the rookie big board uh, over on YouTube, John Lobb, is a big fan of Will Shipley. So I do think there are Shipley fans out there. Uh, but I think this is a situation where I want to like him more than I actually do. And just to kind of circle back, Shipley, supposedly fantastic pro day, don't care at all. <laughs> yeah. Zero cares. Yeah. I don't know, man. Why, why didn't we see it already? Um, you know, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt, but I, I'm not going to, you know, the, so the way I, I'll start here by saying, you know, the way I approach the combine is, is I'm looking for for ways my eyes were wrong on tape, right? Um, and I think at the combine, I trust that a little bit more if I see a better 40 time, if a better athletic testing score time uh, than I do in the pro day, just because it's a more controlled environment. So I, I, maybe I'm being a little uh, flippant in terms of I don't care at all. But it's just, it's not enough to push me over the edge on a guy. You already sh shared one of your kind of small scoot guys when you hyped up Isaiah Davis a moment ago. So he won't fit into this particular question. He was on the sheet for it. But among the small school backs, is there anyone that we really need to get a closer, you know, pay more attention to as the, the draft gets closer? You know, you have the likes of Ali, Vidal, Holani. There's... And anyone there standing out for you um, in this class? Not really, to be honest. I think Rasheen Ali is the guy on tape who looks the best out of that group. Um, I'm not a Vidal guy. I, I know there's a Vidal movement out there. I didn't see good vision at all from him um, when, when I was watching his tape. And he looked, you know, he looked like a clunky runner. He didn't look confident. Um, you know, when I watch uh, Rashina Lee, I see a shifty runner. I see he has the ability to break defenders in short space. He's a fluid runner with good cutback lanes. Um, and, and if he can get to the second level of the field, 
He can accelerate downfield very nicely, but he's coming off of that injury in the senior bowl. So, you know, it'll be a question as to whether that health, you know, really cuts down his draft capital, not a small school guy, but can, can I give a different sleeper uh, for this answer instead? Oh yes. Oh yes. Okay. Because I am anxious whenever I can to talk about uh, Cody Schrader out of Mizzou. And he started off as a small school guy. So I feel like it, it almost counts towards this answer. So Cody Schrader starts his college career playing for Division II. Uh, Truman State, I believe, is Division II team. He transfers up to Mizzou. So he goes right to the SEC. Within the first month of, of being on campus, he wins out the starting running back job. And he hasn't looked back since. He led the SEC in rushing in 2023, which is a nice feat behind the Missouri offensive line. He's got great burst. He's a decisive runner. He hits the hole hard. He sees space very well. Uh, he's got he's got uh, great footwork. Uh, he's able to shake guys in tight space. He's a really slippery runner. He's one of these guys where you know he hits a gap and you think he has no chance coming out on the other side, and he just bursts through and gets downfield very well. And I think he's a really underrated pass catcher as well. You know, Mizzou actually had him run routes moving downfield. He had good hands. He created separation. He turned after the catch, went upfield, got some yak ability. So five eight. 202, so a little bit smaller than you want. But in this class, you got to look for guys where you can get them. And and Cody Schrader is a guy who I'm probably going to leave my drafts with, you know, 75 plus percent exposure to, uh, especially if I can get them in the late third, fourth rounds, which is the earliest I've seen them go so far. I attended Truman State University. So oh, did I get it I'm, right? Is that yeah. the right school? Yes. It is. Okay, yes. good. Excited for him. I mean, I'm a little bit skeptical, but excited for him. I mean, obviously, Truman State doesn't have a lot of star NFL draft prospects. So um, I put that in the rookie guide. I think Curtis cut it in order to get enough space for I wrote a lot about <laughs> Trader in the rookie guide. So the other name that people are going to be really trying to figure out is Isaac Rendo. Obviously, he has this, you know, historic combine. People will say, I mean, if you can't play, you can't play. And that, you know, he wasn't a good college player. And yet, I mean, Sports Info Solutions, you know, actually charts him as being, you know, probably superior to his teammate who had, you know, a little bit of draft buzz before maybe not performing as well as hoped at the combine. So, I, I mean, where are we with this? Because, number one, I do think he's more productive than just absolutely zero. And then, number two, right. he's also more athletic than a lot of the, like, athletic freaks in the past who failed. And the name that always kind of pops into my head is Chris Henry, who was a favorite, a famous overdraft in 2007. The difference, both in terms of production and in terms of, like, just how athletic the guy is, is pretty different. And so I throw that name out there because... I mean, obviously, we know that these guys who actually weren't good college players, it doesn't necessarily matter if you're athletic. But I mean, Grendel's like on a whole different scale. How should we be looking at his resume, especially again in the weaker class where people are going to be pretty desperate for names? Yeah, so Grendel's interesting. You know, it, when I'm watching tape, he wasn't the Louisville running back that I that I initially watched tape on. Uh, you know, I, I was into watch Jawar Jordan, and post combine, I had to go back and I had to watch Grendo. And you know, it's really interesting. So 60220, and then you got that speed, right, that he showed at the combine. And you're like, dude, this guy's got to be a beast, right? But you watch his tape. And for a guy who's 221, he's not physically dominant. You know, he really got overwhelmed physically against um ACC defenders, which is not, you know, if you look actually, you you look at the way Louisville deployed their running backs, George Jordan, who's 5'9, 193 was more oftentimes used at the goal line and was a more successful goal line runner than Garendo. So that, that to me is, is a big red flag. I think the, the question for Garendo, right, is how how is he going to be deployed in an NFL offense, right? This is somebody who I think if you put him in the right spot, he's a rotational back, 
He's able to get schemed into space. He can make some big home run plays. I don't know that he's ever going to be that guy who's 225 touches, right? Who's going to be the guy on his NFL team, which means if anything, he's probably going to be more of a headache for you on a fantasy football roster, right? Because there may be some weeks where he gets eight carries and, and puts up, you know, 80 yards. And there might be some weeks where he gets eight carries and puts up 12 yards and, and you, you know, you don't want to have him in your, your lineup in the wrong spot. So uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, 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 it's a real mismatched profile. You know, I do see somebody who's slippery. Um, I, I see the way he carries his momentum forward. He's got good lateral size. You know, he can be slippery. Um, but it, it's, it's not consistent in the, for me, the big red flag is the vision. I don't think he sees space very well. And it's hard for me to get behind any prospect who I don't feel sees space well at the college level, because it's not going to get any easier in the NFL.